Adam Brown is a rheumatologist at the Cleveland Clinic and the host of the Ruminations podcast. On today's episode, we discuss why someone would want to go into rheumatology and why they're usually the smartest doctors in the hospital. My words, not his. We discuss the basics of inflammatory arthritis, how to interpret an abnormal ANA, and why we shouldn't be so laser-focused on our own organ systems if the patient isn't improving as expected, and why rheumatologic conditions should be considered. We also talk about why gout is such an underappreciated phenomenon. Dr. Brown went to med school at the University of New Mexico and then did his residency at Georgetown in internal medicine, where we overlapped for a year. He then did a fellowship in rheumatology and a second fellowship in vasculitis, both at the Cleveland Clinic, where he stayed on as an attending. He's also the author of the review book, Rheumatology Made Ridiculously Simple, making him the perfect person to explain rheumatology on this podcast. He has a way of making complex and esoteric conditions easy to understand and even funny. And I know you'll enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Adam Brown, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. So... Why, what made you decide to go into rheumatology? Yeah, so rheumatology is kind of a strange field. And in my opinion, I don't think people get, they don't get like uh, exposed to it early enough. I, for one, did not either. Like I didn't really get, hear much about it through medical school. And then I just happened upon a rotation in my second year of residency, actually. And then prior to that, I was gung-ho, I was going to do cardiology. And then I happened to do this rotation and I found out this, this specialty it's one of the only specialties that I saw that actually kind of expands instead of like narrows. And because still all these diseases are multi-systemic. So you're still dealing with the lungs, you're still dealing with the kidneys, you're dealing with the heart, you're dealing with the brain in rheumatology. And I thought I liked that a lot because what kind of drove me into internal medicine in the first place is kind of the diagnostic aspect of it. These uh, I like putting the puzzle pieces together, which a lot of internal medicine doctors do. And I thought rheumatology really kind of like holds that up really well. And, and it's kind of like all you do pretty much. It's like, exactly. Cause once you arrive at the diagnosis, you're just going to give everyone steroids anyway. right? <laughs> that is somewhat correct. Yes. But <laughs> let me, let me, let me expand on that. So what the, one of the tricky parts is how do you get them off the steroids? Right. So that's like, we have these diseases. Let's look at like vasculitis, for instance, that is hundred percent fatal if it's not treated. And even back in the days when we had, when we first got his steroids in the late 40s and early 50s, the disease was still fatal. So steroids does not actually completely take over and you can use it forever. These patients still died. And, and got, I, I wasn't so. planning on plugging your podcast until the end, but you had an excellent episode on the history of steroids. So oh, thanks. Yeah, while yeah. we're on the topic of steroids, <laughs> listen, listen, to, uh, listen to ruminations, episode on the history of steroids. It's just, very, yeah, very it's just really, really, yeah, it's an interesting history and it involved lots of different things, including the government and the military and yeah. And like how much of a game changer it was when steroids came out, it's pretty exciting, but we learned pretty quickly steroids was not the answer. It kind of gave us an idea that inflammation was a major player in these conditions and we we're able to stop the inflammation rapidly, but it's not the long-term solution. So Yes, you're right. So we give the, we give steroids quite a bit and because they work rapidly and our other drugs do not work as rapidly to like, but to get them off steroids is kind of the uh, the trick. And now we have a whole lot of options. So that's to answer your question further, why I went into rheumatology is that we have like a new, really amazing drug like out every year. Like every year we have something else to use on people and like conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, which were previously completely debilitating where people couldn't use their hands, they couldn't pick up things, they couldn't eat because their hands were in so much pain and you got such severe deformities. And now we have, now if I take someone with room to arthritis, like, oh, great, here's this, these, here's these medications, you're going to feel great. And it's just like this amazing turnaround and not that long of a time uh, once we started understanding the immune system better. So it's like, it's this kind of field that has really nebulous diagnosis that people kind of consider a kind of like a black box. Like, oh, I don't know what to do with this ANA. I don't know what to do with this ANCA. 
sent into rheumatology. You know, it's, it's like kind of this black box of medicine that most people don't really know what to do with. It's, it's to send them to a rheumatologist. But it's also like multi-systemic. So we're dealing with the brain, we're dealing with the lung, we're dealing with the kidneys, and we're working with a whole bunch of different specialists. And ENT, as yourself, we work with all the time. And so it's kind of like this, it's putting the puzzle piece together, I think, to the nth degree rheumatology. And, um, and now we have this much better understanding of the immune system so we're able to like take advantage of that and use these very targeted therapies that are kind of like a knife that is like take away one aspect of this cascade that stops inflammation hopefully with much less side effects than the medications of your as they say yeah one of the one of the questions that i like asking my guests whenever i have a specialist on is for example, if I'm going to be having a dermatologist on in a couple of weeks, I would say, what should every radiologist know about dermatology, right? Because how much would a radiologist really need to know in their practice about dermatology? They're not, right. they're, I would imagine they're not getting many scans. No, that's um, true. But I thought for rheumatology, you don't really have that. There's everybody, every specialty out there needs to know a good rheumatologist to send their patients to because it, it really touches every organ system. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I literally, I can't think of especially that I don't interact with at all just because I just, I just, I was going to sit trying to think maybe a geriatrician, but I just spoke with a geriatrician last week about a patient. So it's like, so, so you're right. No, we absolutely, right. we, we sit down with pathologists, we sit down with neurologists, we sit down with neuroradiologists, sit down with ENT, sit down with pulmonary. You're talking, yeah, you're absolutely right. It touches upon everything. But I can still answer the question of what things I think everyone should know about because they're, I think they're very, very useful. Well, let's start, let's start more general. So sure. you have a med student in front of you. Mm -hmm. They're rotating with you and they have no idea. They don't know what they're going into. You don't know what they're going into. So you don't really have any focus in terms of make sure you know this or that. So what would you want them to take home about your field? What is, what is every specialist uh, really need to know about your field? What, what are the basics of the most common diseases that you treat? So I think the most uh, the most basic is recognizing inflammatory joint pain versus non-inflammatory joint pain, and I don't think I really got a good understanding of this until fellowship, and it's extremely simple. Joint pain is extremely common that everyone knows, and it's a very re common reason why people go in to see the doctor. Ninety-nine percent of it is what we're considered non-inflammatory. So you know they pulled something, they they hurt your rotator cuff, or they're painting the ceiling. Or you have kind of wear and tear arthritis, or your thumbs hurt opening jars, which is non-inflammatory. Or you have fibromyalgia, which is non-inflammatory, which is kind of through the muscles and the joints causing pain. So 99% of joint pain is not inflammatory. So what happens is you have these kind of aches and pains, and it usually gets worse the more you use your joint. You hurt your shoulder, it hurts to move the shoulder, right? If you have wear and tear arthritis in your thumb or your fingers, it hurts to type or hurts to, you know, grab your hand on a steering wheel or hurt open jars. So the 1% is the inflammatory. And inflammatory can be broken down further, but I'm going to talk about mostly autoimmune inflammatory. So that encompasses rheumatoid arthritis, it encompasses lupus, uh, psoriatic arthritis. So the much, much more rare cause of the joint. So these present very differently. So this is the pain that you wake up with. So the autoimmune diseases loves to attack when you're resting. So it will get you when you first wake up in the morning, your, your fingers will be really stiff and swollen. And it's like, oh, it's a hard time moving them. But once you start moving them, it, uh, it feels better, but it takes a good hour or two hours to start moving. You start feeling better. So when you have a patient that says, yeah, it's actually worse when I first get up or worse when I get off an airplane or worse when I'm sitting down watching TV and get up for the first time in a while. But once I start moving, it feels good. So if you get a joint, if you get joint pain that feels better, the more you use that joint, it's pretty suspicious that this is an autoimmune inflammatory condition doing this. You might say, what about gout? So gout is separate. It's, it's a different process. It's not autoimmune. It's called autoinflammatory. Because if you move a joint attacked by gout, that will not go good. It'll hurt like crazy. So gout's a little bit different. So autoimmune is more encompassing by rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriatic arthritis those that kind of uh, category but if it gets better the more you move the joint that's kind of a big tell this could be inflammatory autoimmune inflammatory so that's a good one to know i feel like this applies to me because because if i try to exercise in the morning i feel like the tin man right like yeah. i can't i can't move at all but if i if i try to exercise in the afternoon or in the evening then uh -huh. i'm able to move a whole lot better that's not what you're talking about 
You're no, talking so, about yeah, so stiffness is pretty common. The stiffness lasting like two hours is not. So if you have yeah. a pain or a stiffness, it takes like two hours to get moving, it's a little unusual. If it takes you 15, 20 minutes or jump in the shower after the time the time you get out of the shower, you feel pretty good. That's normal. That's from living. Just a side note about that is back pain. So back pain is super common, but if you have a person in their 20s or 30s and they have back pain worse in the morning and it gets better the more they do, you really should have them see a rheumatologist to make sure this is not an inflammatory back pain, which is very treatable and it's good to treat early on. So that's one thing. So back pain is really common. So if you get it worse in the morning and it gets better the more you move that back, it's uh, it's because you should probably see a rheumatologist just to make sure that's not uh, ankylosing, early ankylosing spondylitis. Oh, wow. Definitely keep that in mind. So one thing that you mentioned earlier in the podcast was that rheumatology is this black box. And uh, I would 100% agree with that statement. So you authored Rheumatology Made Ridiculously Simple, right? That's that's one of those review books that I remember from med school. Microbiology yeah. Made Ridiculously Simple. And so help us make something ridiculously simple, right? Sure. So take a diagnosis that you frequently see after the patient's had it for a while, meaning Patients had symptoms, but it's been hard for other physicians to pinpoint what's causing those symptoms and try and simplify it for us so that it can it can expedite their recovery. Sure. So let's give two examples. Let's do ankyovasculitis and let's do lupus. So let's start with ankyovasculitis. Ankyovasculitis is comprised of three different vasculitides. I'm going to focus on just one of them. It's called granulomatosis with polyangiitis or GPA, formerly known as Wegener's uh, granulomatosis. So this is a disease that causes sinusitis and it causes um, lung disease. And that could be a lot of different things from just nodules in the lungs, or it could be on the other end of the spectrum is frank, it's called diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, where actually all the blood and all the capillaries start leaking in the lungs and the lungs fill up with blood and it becomes rapidly fatal if not recognized. And it can also involve the kidneys where it causes what we call a rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, which is rapid uh, inflammation of the kidneys leading to uh, rising creatinine and rapid renal failure. This disease can involve lots of different organs, but those are the most commonly ones. So if you take them one at a time, let's say the sinuses, which normally presents with, when you see someone with sinusitis, you're not going to be like, oh, this is what, this is granulomatosis with polyangiitis, right? No, sinusitis is very common, as you can attest to. But when you should start thinking about underlying rheumatologic diseases, when other organs start getting involved, right? So if you have sinusitis for in a couple of years and that's it, then I wouldn't think granulomatosis with polyangiitis. But if something's changed in the sinusitis, you get lots of crusting, or let's say you have a perforation in the septum of the of the sinus, it means it's pretty severe, right? And it's not getting better with normal therapy. So if your sinusitis is not getting better, you're trying different sprays, trying rinses, it's getting worse and worse. Maybe you get a chest X-ray, right? Because in 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 encovasculitis, you'll see infiltrate in the X-ray, so you'll say, "Hey, it looks like a pneumonia." Okay, and but if you have sinusitis plus that infiltrate that should kind of clue you that something more systemic could be going on. And autoimmune diseases are often systemic, so they're involving multiple organs. So that's one kind of just key thing to note about is that if you have one organ involved, say the sinuses, treating it and treating it, not getting better, not getting better, maybe just look somewhere else, make sure it's not involved anywhere else, or ask the patient, hey, are you getting short of the breath? Are you coughing? Do you ever have any blood when you cough up? So that's like one of the diseases that can take a while to diagnose, understandably, because people aren't jumping to granulomatous polyangiitis when they see a sinus patient with sinusitis. Right. I'm not going to start ordering those labs on every single sinus infection that I see because then some of them are going to be slightly abnormal and they're going to end up needing to see you for no good reason. Absolutely. Just because they're elevated, they're, they're one point out of the reference range or something like that. Exactly right. Yeah. So they have like, if they don't respond ever and they're getting worse, that should kind of open your mind like, hey, something's going on. We should look elsewhere. Another example is it could start in the lungs and the patient cut short of breath and coughing. And again, you're not thinking, oh, this is granulomatosis with polyangiitis, a rare disease. So you get treated for pneumonia. This happens all the time and they don't get better. And then there, it gets worse and progressively worse and progressively worse. And then the scientists get involved. And then someone notices the creatinine starts going up. So multiple other systems start getting involved, which finally clues you in. So that's what you should, and that's that's my kind of two cents about it, is if you have something common like pneumonia or sinusitis, 
and normal treatment isn't getting better. And it's, in fact, it's getting worse. And then something else gets involved. Like either the creatinine is going up and we don't have a good explanation for it. Our lungs are getting involved or the sinus is involved, vice versa. Start looking elsewhere. And then that's a reasonable time to order these tests. Is when conventional therapy is not working and other, other involvement starts happening. And lupus, lupus is not one that usually gets delayed because everyone orders an ANA on everybody, but that's probably not a good way to do it. So lupus. So, so we're definitely going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay, gotcha. So I'll hold on that then. On the, I mean, ra- rather, we're going to be talking about the what to do with the abnormal ANA, but we we'll continue <laughs> okay, with the lupus. Little, okay, gotcha. So lupus is uh, a strange disease that, inv- again, involves a whole lot of different organs. And uh, what should clue you in is not body pain. It should be lots of people say, oh, it, it, it hurt all over. Maybe it's lupus. Lupus usually presents with inflammatory arthritis, right? So it actually has the worst in the morning, gets better as the day goes, and they have like visible swelling, okay? So they have kind of like pain from head to toe. Lupus shouldn't be first on your differential, okay? So lupus is actually usually causes an inflammatory arthritis, again, in combination with other organ systems, such as the skin, where they have like a malar rash. Another pearl about malar rashes, you'll hear patients say they have malar rashes all the time, but it's a malar rash is, can be confused with flushing very often or rosacea. And those conditions, so flushing and rosacea often get worse with alcohol use or being in like a hot shower, the, the facial the facial flush, okay? So if you have Something like, that's going to make you vasodilate. Exactly. Exactly yeah. right. So Alcohol if you have a patient, peripheral vasodilation. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a patient, they oh, every time I get in the shower, I get a malar rash. It's not a malar rash. It's like a, <laughs> that's like flushing. Okay. So a malar rash from lupus like lasts days to weeks. Okay, it doesn't scar, but it doesn't just come and go rapidly. So if you have a patient with like coming, going rapidly, think rosacea, think flushing, um, and especially if it gets worse with heat or um, alcohol, think rosacea as well. Uh, so if, you, if it, it, the malar rash, a true malar rash actually lasts for like a while. So it's not just like a thing that comes and goes rapidly. So uh, lu- another thing about lupus is that it causes glomerulonephritis as well. And that'll often be uh, visible proteinuria. So if you have a patient, especially a young woman, African-American woman, with unexplained proteinuria, it's a reasonable thing to check for. Proteinuria is kind of a hallmark of lupus nephritis. And then it can also involve the bone marrow. So if you have like a cytopenia, either low platelets, low white count, or unexplained anemia, then lupus is a reasonable thing to check for. So it, it, so it involves multiple organs, but it does specific things for those organs. It's not just, oh, creatinine going up must be lupus. No, it's usually creatinine going up plus proteinuria. Or if they have an unex- anemia, but they have a GI bleed, it's probably not lupus. You know? So it's like unexplained anemia to so kind of go down the rabbit hole of lupus. But it's a very easy thing to test for, so it gets tested like that pretty commonly. Right, that the ANA. So right. we, were, we were talking about that earlier because like, if I have a patient with a dry mouth or a burning tongue or an unexplained perforation in their septum, I will order a battery of rheumatologic labs to make sure I'm not missing mm. a sarcoid or a Wegner's. And frequently those labs are a little bit out of the reference range. And I'm mm. not sure when to really, like if the patient has no other symptoms, but I look up their nose, I mean, sometimes it happens, it's going to sound gross, from just picking their nose. Yeah, really Like they pick a that. nose, they get a crust, forms another crust, it keeps picking, and they eventually, eventually burrow a hole, a hole in their nose. Or they had surgery, or they, you know, there was cocaine use. Sure. But if I have an unexplained perforation with no other symptoms and no sinus problems, you know, it still warrants some type of investigation as well as those other things, right? Xerostomia with no clear cause or a burning tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm going to want to order some rheumatologic labs. But if I have a patient that has an ANA that's maybe one point out of the reference range, how do I know what to do? How do I not convince them to fly to Cleveland and <laughs> knock down your door until they're seen? They absolutely need to knock them out of my door. I got to get to the bottom of this ANA pronto. <laughs> <laughs> No, so something good to know about ANA is the longer you live, the higher the risk you have a positive ANA test. And up to 20% of the population at any given age will have a positive ANA, but it doesn't mean anything. So what's happening is your body's making antibodies all the time. It's making it to thousands of different things just to, it's 
it's just testing the waters, right? It's making antibodies to life of polysaccharide ever so often. And then if it, hit, if it hits its mark and the antibody works, it, it continues to proliferate the antibody to life of polysaccharide. So your body's making antibodies to lots of different things all the time. So it's not a surprise that it makes A and A ever so often. So any, any, in any given time, you probably have a very low titer of A and A floating around in your blood. You have thousands and th- hundreds of thousands of antibodies floating around all the different things. So you have an A and A floating around. It's your body's job to recognize that, oh, the A and A is actually against my own body. So A and A enzyme nuclear, it actually can bind to a component of my DNA and actually cause inflammation. That shouldn't happen. So your body does not turn on the proliferate button for the antibody. So it doesn't recognize it and doesn't like make it start producing all sorts of ANA antibodies. So the point that what I'm trying to say is that everyone has some ANA. Okay, so you, your body's constantly making random antibodies to all sorts of things, but it's the body's immune system's ability, uh, job to recognize when it shouldn't be making those, uh, shouldn't be like turning on the, the treadmill and, and, and turning those antibodies out. So everyone has a little bit. The longer you live, the higher the chance you have it. And ANA, a one positive antibody by itself is not, as you can recognize, it's not definitely diagnostic of lupus because lots of people have ANAs. The titer is fairly useful. So we usually order an ANA by IFA, it's called. And it's usually positive when it's 1 to 40. And then it doubles. This goes 1 to 40, 1 to 80, 1 to 160. Ever, rarely do I get a patient with true lupus who's like, who has 1 to 80. It's usually like 1 to 360 or 1 to 1,280. It's usually pretty high. And then when you have a patient with, with those antibodies, and they have something, they have severe dry mouth, for example. They have some joint pain. You're not exactly sure if it's inflammatory or not or if they have some anemia or a low white count, and that's when we say, okay, well, let's look further into this. And that's when you say, check, it's called the extractable nuclear antigen, which is a panel, it's called the ENA panel. So it's easy to remember, ANA, then ENA panel. And the ENA has all the different other little lupus antibody tests. And these are not like usually like, aha moment. It's usually kind of just like another puzzle piece. So if they have, let's say a Smith or an RNP plus the ANA, plus maybe a little bit low white count, that really raises suspicion that something's going on, that it's usually autoimmune. So the ANA is kind of like a gateway blood test, okay? If you have something going on and it's positive, that can kind of lead down to further tests that can give you a more accurate diagnosis. But anyone can order the ENA. So one way to do it at our facility is actually an ANA with reflex. So if the ANA is positive and it has like a, a titer greater than 1 to 40, it actually reflex to the ENA right away. So it, it, it won't do it if the ANA is negative, which is a very reasonable thing to do to not test everyone with an ENA panel. But if the ANA is positive and high enough, it automatically reflects to an ENA panel. And again, those are much more informative. So if you have like a, the ENA panel is like a whole bunch of different blood tests, chromatin, Smith, RNP, SSA, SSB, which you probably know and love. And if again, if one of those are positive plus the ANA plus something else clinically that looks like lupus, that kind of raises your suspicion a whole lot more. Um, the two things to know about uh, in terms of specificity of like, oh, if you if these are positive, you have to convince me they don't have lupus. And that's going to be the Smith positivity and double-stranded DNA positivity. So those are the two blood tests to know about that if they have it, if, if they don't have lupus now, they might get it in the future. Okay, so that's like a, a they have much higher specificity for the diagnosis of lupus than like say RMP and chromatin and SSA SSB. So the answer is you almost no, you don't have to knock down anyone's door for an ANA or an SSA SSB. It's like a, the only the only time that's a little bit more urgent is probably an ANCA positivity, which could uh, be uh, more rapidly fatal than most of the other conditions that we treat. Oh, another quick caveat about ANA which I didn't know about tell the fellow <laughs> is that they're positive like eight to 10 years before disease develops. So if you have a high titer for, check for some reason, and let's say they have ANA of one to 1,280, but nothing else. It's kind of like, I usually watch those patients like once a year, say, Hey, let's, why don't you just check in and see how we're doing every year? Because we know these antibodies are present. Well, 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 before the disease actually comes. That's interesting. I wonder how that would work as like a screening test. Like, just, you know, oh, I'm getting my colonoscopy this year. Should I get my ANA checked? And then, but, uh, well, the thing it's is, it's unclear if it would be a benefit. Probably uh, not. So they, they do, they're doing some trials for rheumatoid arthritis right now who have the, the blood test for rheumatoid arthritis, but do not have clinical rheumatoid arthritis. And they're giving those people 
uh, very mild immunosuppressive medication to see if it actually delays the development of rheumatoid arthritis? And the answer is, I don't know yet. I'll probably know by the end of the year. For rheumatoid arthritis, anyway, not lupus. Rheumatoid arthritis is a little more straightforward of a diagnosis because you have yeah. two blood tests plus joint pain when you have the diagnosis. But lupus is a lot more ambiguous. Well, we will check in on the Ruminations <laughs> podcast. That's right. I'll keep you up to date on the Ruminations podcast. So, you know, you keep giving us these, these tidbits about, well, I, I didn't know this until I was a fellow and I didn't, uh, you know... But, the more you move, the better it gets, as opposed mm-hmm. to with osteoarthritis, the more you move, the worse it gets. Oh, is there anything else that you think that you learned either in med school or in residency that you either became more solidified in your brain in fellowship or afterwards, or actually contradicted something that you had learned in, in med school? Like an example for me, something I hate, is post-nasal drip, right? Like one of the things I learned in med school was that post-nasal drip was one of, one of the most common causes of cough. Well, if your post-nasal drip is causing you to cough. It means you're aspirating it. So you've got other problems to worry about. Postnasal drip doesn't actually, you swallow postnasal drip. It doesn't, there's nothing to do with cough. So is there anything like that that you experienced in, in fellowship that you found out, wow, that actually wasn't, wasn't correct that you can clarify for us? Yeah, sure. Well, if, probably not as good of an example as you have, but I think that, well, lupus is one of them. I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep harping on lupus because I think that people often told me in medical school, if you don't know what's going on, check for lupus. Um, but I think that's a bit of a, <laughs> I think you're going to overdose, diagnose, diagnose, overdiagnose uh, lupus if we do that. Uh, and but, syphilis, right? I think syphilis, syphilis falls into that. Yeah. Check yeah, for syphilis totally right. and check yeah. for lupus. So I think, I think syphilis and tuberculosis are definitely things that, uh, that are reasonable, but at this day and age, we don't see them as often. But lupus does like specific things. It doesn't just do everything. So that's like, that's like, that's like kind of why it's something that kind of annoys me. Because it causes inflammatory joint pain. It causes legit cytopenias. It causes like glomerular nephritis with major proteinuria. It doesn't just cause like creatinine to bump ever so often, check for lupus. You know, it's like not everything, lupus can do everything. It's not really true. It does specific things, but it does a lot of specific things. So it's a little bit more confusing. But another thing that I think that warrants more discussion is gout. Because you hear about gout a lot, and I think when I was a fellow, sorry, a resident, when I was an internal medicine resident, and like in medical school, you kind of like blew off gout, right? It was like, oh, it's just gout, you know? It's like, no, not a big deal. You have a big swollen joint, takes an allopurinol, it'll go away. But gout's actually like the most painful condition that I treat, but I didn't really appreciate until I saw many, many patients with gout. Like you have these like big buff guys who are like, I wanted to cut my foot off. Like the, the pain is unbelievably intense and it's not really something to blow off. And I think that people don't take it seriously enough to treat it seriously. And it could be like a pretty devastating disease, especially as it gets uh, worse and worse. And with at least in the United States, the levels, the numbers are going up and up. People who have it, it's the most, it's the most common type of inflammatory arthritis affecting about 5% of the population, which is probably higher than that in reality. Because, I mean, the more alcohol we drink, the more fatty foods we drink, eat, the higher the risk of getting gout. And I think that it's just like, it's something that I think we should take a little bit more seriously because it's severely painful for the disease. And we have a lot of great treatments for it. Another thing, another reason I, I have a special place in my heart for gout is it's something that we kind of blow off, as I mentioned before, but it's something we didn't understand until 1962. So it's like this condition that is no, known f- from the ages, right? The Greeks recognized gout. Uh, people talk about gout throughout time is actually kind of a sexy disease to have in the 1800s because... I mean, you were rich. Yeah, exactly. It meant you're rich. It meant you're like nobility. It meant that you had enough money just to sit around and eat all day. But most people <laughs> did not. Most people did not have that ability, right? It was, so people who had that, people who had gout were usually of nobility or like they were judges and they're sitting around all day making laws. But we still didn't understand what, where it came from. Now so, we call it karma. <laughs> so the the night so the crystals wasn't discovered until 1962. So it's just like it's kind of unbelievable to me that we have this disease that I'm like, oh, it's a scout. But it's like, oh, actually, we had little understanding of what was causing it until 1962. So it was fairly recently in time in the history of medicine that we actually recognized what it was doing, and it's amazing how rapidly we started to blow it off, like in terms of like in terms of, in terms of like the seriousness of the condition. And you would think with it affecting the richest of society, they would have put more funds towards researching yeah. it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, especially in yeah, 1800. It was. So people were getting an idea that uh, uric acid was, was the driver behind it. They didn't really recognize how to do it. 
Uh, but I think it was the technology with, they had to figure out polarized light microscopy. They had to do a lot of things. The guy who actually figured out that when they figured out, sorry, when they figured out that uric acid actually, uh, this is one of my favorite stories in medicine, when they figured out that uric acid was actually the it sound in those joints, the way they proved that gout actually triggered them, sorry, that uric acid actually triggered the inflammation was two doctors in uh, Pennsylvania, the University of Pennsylvania actually got a syringe full of uric acid and injected their knees. So they injected oh. a left knee with the uric acid and the right knee they inject with saline as a control. And my favorite part about this is, is a fellow and an attending who did this. My favorite part about this is then they wrote, and then we went about the day of our normal hospital day. So they went to work. Like <laughs> after they did it on the day. And within, within three hours of then injecting it, they were laying on the ground screaming like in agony because their knees were just hugely blown up and swollen because they had the acute gout flare in their knee for the first time. Adam, the, publish or perish. Publish or perish. This is how you <laughs> publish, they got to right? do. It's how you do. They got published. <laughs> and, and we're talking about it 50 years later on a podcast. I guess it worked out for them. Yeah. And then the other fun part about it is they wanted to see the normal progression of disease. So the original plan was not to do anything. No, no intervention, no painkillers, nothing. But within an hour of them laying on the ground, they're begging for like steroids and painkillers. So it didn't work out for them. It didn't work out as they planned. They recognized how unbelievably painful gout is. And uh, they recognized that uric acid actually triggers the gout flare. So that's how they did it. They figured out by literally injecting their knee with the crystal. So do you see it more commonly now that it's popular for people to go on like the Atkins diet and keto and paleo where you're eating all these high fat, high protein foods? Are you, are yeah, you seeing are it seeing more it. often in people that are doing these diets? Yeah, we actually are seeing it fairly high in like in high, uh, high meat take, high, high, sorry, high like red meat intake, like Atkins, things like that. We're seeing it in younger people too. So yeah, you're right. We are, it's usually, it was usually kind of like in the 50 year old male kind of getting it. Uh, but now we're seeing it in fairly younger age if you have a very, very high protein diet. So it's still, it's still not common in young people, but that is something that we see. With, the, with those certain diets, for sure. So maybe we should start referring to it as the, the gautogenic diet. G- gautogenic, gautogenic diet, I like that. It's a good range. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is there anything else that you think bears mentioning? We, we, this is pretty comprehensive, so the yeah. answer is no, it's totally reasonable, but, but is there anything else that you think that we should uh, bring up today for our general medical audience? Yeah, so if, you're general, if, you're, if you have interest in specialization, I think that trying to, I'll put a plug in for rheumatology, just because I think it's a, super interesting career that's moving very rapidly uh it's like uh every literally every year we have a new drug and we have a new understanding of different pathways which is leading us to new, discovering new diseases you know so it's like some diseases come out that we didn't know about five years ago so it's just like it's kind of a fascinating place to be to like watch this watch a fairly rapidly moving field that uh, again, that these patients used to be unbel- have suffer unbelievably from these diseases, and now we have treatment that can really make a huge difference in people's lives. So it's very intellectually satisfying because we get called, like in the hospital, for example, if something major is going on with someone and they don't know what it is, they call rheumatology. You know, it's like we have this, like it's just like we have these weird diseases that do weird things, and we see this stuff. So it's just it's kind of a fun, it's a very fun, fun position to be in because I mean, this I don't, I don't think there's a field like it. Again, it's like. A specialization that doesn't really narrow; it kind of broadens out. And if you want to do the same thing every day, don't. It's not. If you want to like be extremely good at doing one thing, this is in the field for you. It's like this is like a field that does a whole lot of different things, and uh, every day is different. You're not sure what you're going to walk into when you walk into a clinic door. So it's 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 an exciting field, and I hope people pay attention to it. I was not exposed to it until fairly late in the game, so I like telling people to see if they can get exposure to it early on. I think you'll like it. Yeah, and that's an excellent plug plug for the specialty and also an excellent plug for not throwing away your otoscope and your uh, your ophthalmoscope and all the rest of the stuff that you bought in medical school that you thought you might not use because you guys have to use it all. We do, we do. We look at all the different body parts. We look at MRIs of brains. We look at people's nostrils. We look at people's ears. I look at people's capillaries on a microscope. I look at all sorts of stuff. And I even, I, I spend, I look at urine like, uh, a couple times a week, looking at people who have, um, I suspect them having glomerular nephritis. So it's it's kind of a, a gamut of things that we look for. And, you know, all the fun diseases you learn about and like all the fun physical exam findings you learn about in medical school, like 80% of them are rheumatologic. 
So we, did, we find like cool stuff. Are you going to do a podcast at any point on the history of urinalysis? Because I, I remember in medical school, we learned that smelling urine used to be part of the test. They would, they right. would put in the results like, and it smells like until the, until the lab techs discovered that mm, it, that wasn't actually used very often. And yeah. they could stop smelling the urine. <laughs> I still taste and smell every urine sample. It <laughs> it's, a, it's part of being a good doctor, okay? <laughs> Rectal exam, tasting and smelling the urine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I can tell you his podcast, he's just as entertaining on his own podcast as he is on this podcast. So, uh, Adam, why don't you tell the audience about about ruminations, which the name is near and dear to my heart because sometimes when I'm looking in patients' ears, I find myself Seruminating. Seruminating. Right, that was a terrible. Seruminating. Oh, very good. Very oh, good. <laughs> terrible. But, but tell us, tell us about your podcast. Yeah. So my podcast is built out of my love of understanding where things come from. Like uh, we were just talking before we started recording about the history of uh, rheumatic fever, right? So we have this disease that everyone's oh, this is post group based streptococcal uh, pharyngitis. You know, they can get rheumatic fever, but how, how do people figure that out? So that's kind of my love and what drives me. Of, of understanding the history of this stuff and how it took five to six decades of multiple specialists working together to understand that association between group A strep and, and eventual rheumatic fever. So it takes a lot of work from a lot of different people to understand that. And that's what kind of drive. I like, I like learning that history of medicine, but I also love just going through interesting cases and talking to people who know more about this stuff than I do. So I think that like part of my podcast is going through really fascinating cases and then I, I interview people who know a lot about that disease and they kind of walk us through it. They walk about how, did that, how the diagnosis was made. They walk about how what the pathophysiology is. We then, then walk us through what treatment is now and what treatment may be in the future. So it's just kind of a, it's, it's a podcast built around a lot of different things, uh, interviewing experts in, 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 in the field about certain diseases, going through interesting cases and interviewing experts after that, or talking about uh, history that I find really interesting, like the history of gout, history of glucocorticoids, history of rheumatic fever. And I think it's entertaining. I think that I think it's pretty useful. Like, I think it's just like understanding this stuff and, and hearing these cases of these rare diseases. I think you learn a lot from it. Where, where can people find it? So you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher. I think you can find it on Google. You can find it in, I think, most places. I usually use Apple, but I, uh, but I, uh, I think you can find it in most places. And make sure you spell it correctly. It's not ruminating like uh, you normally spell it. pondering, to, right. It's ruminating. Yeah. Ruminations, that's yes. right. And then room and then nation. Very clever. <laughs> Pretty clever. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, Adam Brown, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Uh, I definitely learned a lot and I will definitely be using my labs a lot more uh, a lot more wisely. So thank you for taking the time. Very good. Well, it was a, it was a pleasure being on. It was fun being here. Thank you. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.